Have we gone live? We have. Welcome. Wonderful. Welcome. Welcome, everyone. Hello, and thank you for joining us. As everyone starts gathering online, we're going to just uh, welcome you and get ready for a presentation on the California Venues Grant Program. We'll be walking you through the California Venues Grant application and its guidelines for nonprofit and for-profit. The information provided will be available on our website and can be found in the California Venues Program and Application Guide. Uh, we have with us today Sue Sigler from Cal Nonprofits, uh, Julie Baker, who is our fearless leader here at Californians for the Arts and California Arts Advocates. We also have uh, Eduardo Robles from Californians for the Arts, and we have several participants from Legistry. We've got Patrice Ross, Harshangi, Blatt, um, and uh, one more person uh, joining us as well um, to answer any questions that we might have. We're going to gather all of your questions, uh, have you email them to me if we can't answer them today, and then we'll make sure to get back to you as we gather more data. I think we're getting close to having everyone online, so I want to go ahead and uh, get started. I'd like to welcome Eduardo Robles from Californians for the Arts. He's going to take care of our technical details for this webinar and our land acknowledgement for today. Again, thank you for joining us. Closed captioning is being provided solely for the convenience of our viewers. Captions are visually displayed over the video, which benefits people who are deaf and hard of hearing, and anyone who cannot hear the audio due to noisy environments. If you would like to disable this feature at the bottom right-hand side of the Zoom window, there is that live transcript button. Please click this button, then select hide subtitle to close the closed captions. The webinar is being recorded. For those that are unable to attend a live webinar or need to refer to content while completing their application, uh, part, part sites, partnership sites have made similar recordings available for your reference. As we begin this webinar, we acknowledge and honor the original inhabitants of our various regions. A land acknowledgement is a critical step towards working with native communities to secure meaningful partnership and inclusion in the stewardship and protection of their cultural resources and homelands. Our institutions were founded upon exclusions and erasures of indigenous peoples. We, we honor and are grateful for the land we occupy and recognize the ongoing damage of settler colonialism. Let's take a moment to honor these ancestral grounds that we are collectively gathered upon and support the resilience and strength that all indigenous people have shown worldwide. I am on the traditional territory of the Chumash peoples. I encourage you to name and acknowledge the native peoples where you are located in the chat box. The chat, box, the chat box will be closed after the land acknowledgement. The Q&A box will remain for outstanding questions. Uh, I appreciate that very much. Next, we're going to have our fearless leader, Julie Baker, join us and tell us a little bit about uh, where we are and how we got here. Thank you so much, Tara, and thanks to everyone who's joining us here today. And Eddie, I just wanted to say, I don't think the closed captioning um, link is working, so maybe you could uh, see if you can figure that out on your end. Um, but in the meantime, uh, yes, it's very exciting that we are here today to talk about the California's Venues Grant Program. I wanted to share with you um, sort of how we got here today, and then Tara and we'll go through uh, sort of all the stuff about getting ready to apply. What we know is that the application is intended to open on Friday. Um, and what I wanted to share, maybe we go to the next slide, a little bit about who we are um, as an organization. We have two, we have California Arts Advocates, which is our 501c4 lobbying organization. And this past budget cycle with uh, NEVA California and California Association of Museums, California Arts Advocates led a coalition to advocate and lobby for a billion dollars in reinvestment to the recovery of the arts, culture, and creative in industries. 
out of that billion dollar request, we were ended up with over $600 million in the budget to, for the recovery of our sector, including this $150 million for the California Venues Grants Program. And that is what we're here to discuss today. Californians for the Arts is a 501c3 organization, and our work here today is a community partner to help you um, with technical assistance to make sure that people know about this program and to give you incredible humans like Tara to support you through it and working with our partners at Cal Nonprofits as well as Neva California. You'll, there will be a series of webinars that we'll be offering. Tara has a specific email that you can reach her at venuesgrant at californiansforthearts.org as well as a phone number, and we will do all our best to answer all of your questions. Um, we can go to the next slide. What mostly I want to talk about um, is how important it is to become advocates so that we can get to this place in time where we actually have uh, funding like this that the state allocated to support uh, live venues and live events and venues to recover from the impact of COVID-19. Uh, we certainly can never do an, any advocacy, one person alone. It is truly the collective that makes that happen. So thank you to everyone who sent in letters, who um, spoke up and uh, supported this initiative. And finally, on just a macro level, what I want to say on this is that we may not have all of your answers today, but I can assure you this team, including Lendistry, are working very closely with the state to, uh, to get all those answers. First, there's legislation that is written that, it, that creates this program. That legislation then goes to the state agency, which is Cal OSBA, the Office of Small Business Advocate. The Office of Small Business Advocate then hired Lendistry to administer this program, and Lendistry works with the community partners to support uh, the sector that it's intended for. And the most important thing that I hope that you can take away today is that if you fit the eligibility requirements that we are going to share with you today, please apply. The most important piece is that you apply between the dates when it opens, likely it's Friday, October 29th, and the end date of November 19th. If you do not apply, and then we find out later you could have been eligible, there's nothing we can do to help you. But if you apply and then you go through the process, we can support you through that. We can also, if it becomes an issue where the interpretation of the legislation is not what we had intended, we can certainly go back to the legislature when they come back in January but we cannot do anything unless you apply. We wanna make sure that this $150 million is expended, that it goes to the people we fought for this to have, and that um, we hope are the people who are here today listening. So I'm excited to introduce Tara Gravis-White, who has worked on the California Relief Grant Program since last April. It's very familiar with uh, how, to, how to navigate these systems. And Tara, please take it away. Thank you, Julie. Um, so as Julie said, we are scheduled to open on Friday the 29th. They generally open at about 9 a.m. If you try to log in at 9 a.m. and it's not quite ready, check back in, a few, in 15, 20 minutes. That's not uncommon, there's a slight delay. Again, I wanna remind you that for the purposes of this webinar, we're gonna be using the Q&A box. We have number of people here on hand being able to answer your questions as we speak. So please put any questions that you have in there now. We can go to the next slide and we're gonna start with a program and an overview and then I'm gonna go into walking through the application itself. I'm gonna just highlight a few points because I'm sure that as you guys get into the website, which I can have um, Eduardo post the link for the website for your reference later, uh, where you're gonna be able to read this on your own. So some things I wanted to let you know, you must have a physical address in the state of California and operate in the state of California in order to apply and that the validation for this is going to be via your tax returns. That the grant award can be the lesser of $250,000 or 20% of the applicant's, applicant's gross earned revenue for the 2019 taxable year. That you must complete a new and separate application. Now, one of the big questions that we're already getting is if you happen to have applied for the California Small Business COVID-19 Relief Grant, are you eligible? The answer is yes. What you need to know if you did apply for that is that the amount of that grant award will be subtracted 
from the amount awarded should you receive a California Venues Grant Award. So that's what I wanted to let you know on that. We can go to the next page. And you're gonna be going through uh, several stages of the application, as you might imagine. The first and more, most important stage of the application is to complete a web application through the Lendistry portal online. As Julie mentioned, apply. If you apply, we can follow up, we can assist. Some of our nonprofits I know are wrapping up their fiscal year, depending on when your fiscal year is. You don't need your documents to apply. Please apply. Um, you, you want to ap apply now. And if you have your documents now, great, let's upload them. If not, you can upload them later. The next thing I wanted to let you know is that there are um, several layers or areas for the application. And so the first would be when you get your application in, it'll say that uh, pending, you know, uh, pending validation. And that means that it's in and it's waiting. Uh, and then you'll go through, you'll be selected, then you'll be validated. And if you're approved, then you have a grantee agreement via DocuSign. The other thing I wanted to let you know is that there will be a requirement to link your business banking account to Lendistry through their Plaid portal. And that uh, if you cannot do that, there are methods to do that in your, um, in your eligibility. When we get into un eligible venue, the, the definitions for eligible venue are defined by performance and audience space that you must have mixing equipment with a PA system and a lighting system and that you engage one or more of the following individuals to carry out the rules. So sound engineer, booker, those kind of things, you can read that there for yourself. That if it's a nonprofit entity and they are offering free events, that, though, that the events must be produced and managed primarily by paid employees. So those are some key things to know. We get into the next page, which is the eligible independent live event. And we need to know, um, you can flip the page, please, Eduardo. Uh, that you, you can be a sole proprietor, a C-Corp, an S-Corp, a limited liability corp, a 501c3, any of these kind of things. The key piece is you must have been in operations prior to June 1 of 2019, and that you must either be currently active or have a plan to reopen. Those are some key points I wanted you to know on that section. We can go on to the next place, page, please, Eduardo. Um, some key things are the NASIS codes. Many of us, uh, if we're in the nonprofit sector, have um, come up with the fact that we're not familiar with NASIS codes, or maybe uh, earlier this year or last year in our grant opportunities or relief opportunities, we had to select a NASIS code, um, and that was a new thing for us. What we want to let you know is that these five NASIS codes are the current NASIS codes approved for this grant. So we we'll encourage you to choose the one that is, that is most applicable to you um, in your operations, in your organization. Uh, and then you wanna pick that. They also wanna make sure that a principal business activity is organizing, pr promoting and producing, uh, hosting events, those kind of things can go into that, that you are char charging ticketing fees or door fees and that the performers are paid and that at least 70% of the earned revenue is generated through these sales. And it goes on to, to define those and determine those for you. Next, we get into what are ineligible businesses. And the list is a little longer than this. I didn't put them all up. If there are individual concerns or questions, um, I'm happy to answer them. You can contact me anytime via email and I'll have that for you at the end of, of the presentation. But a few things I wanted to point out that are important are that 75% uh, of your gross earned revenue needs to be from the state of California. That's generally not an issue if you're a nonprofit, that you must demonstrate a percentage of gross earned revenue decline in California of less than 70% for your quarters two, three, and four, comparatively between 219 and 220, that your business must have a physical is um, that you're, oh, I, I stated that wrong. I, I apologize. That you must have a demonstrated gross revenue decline of more than 70%. Otherwise you're ineligible. I, I apologize for that. And that your business, um, if it does not have a physical address would not be an eligible business. 
and any nonprofit that is not registered as a 501c. So that means fiscally sponsored nonprofits, unfortunately. So I want to point that out. Those are some ineligible things that might impact some of you. We then get on to the eligible uses of the funds on the next page. And most, I wanted to point out that these are retroactive. So these funds can be used for any expenses from March of 2020 onward. So that includes if you've paid some out-of-pocket expenses or you've used your reserve accounts to cover expenses, you can use these funds to um, take care of the reimbursement of that reserve account. So employee expenses, as we all know, are some of our highest payroll, healthcare, sick benefit, insurance, premiums, all those things. Also rent, uh, utilities, any costs associated with reopening your business. And then there is a line that says any other COVID related expenses. So I wanna make sure a lot of people are very concerned because they're used to grants where it's very specific and this is not as specific. So any of these expenses are covered and there's no current um, guideline on reporting. So my recommendation would be just to keep your receipts in case they are asked for. And I also wanted to let you know that grants will be prioritized based on the percentage of revenue decline between 219 and 220. So that's, that's how they're gonna determine that. Next, we're gonna get into the application itself. So when you go over into the application, um, you can see the email address right, the, the URL right there, and I'll have um, Eduardo posted in the chat as well to start the application. And then you're going to want to use your email address and your phone number. It needs to be a cell phone because they're going to be um, sending you a number that's like a code. Uh, so you want to go ahead and put that in there. And then once you've registered your email and your phone and you've entered your code, you can then get into the application. Before you begin, we recommend having all of your documents gathered and all the information you're gonna need because that'll just help you with time and energy in completing your application. Once we get into the application on the next page, it's gonna start asking you for the owner's details of your business. So this needs to be in the case of a business, of course, whoever is the majority owner of the business. And then in the case of a nonprofit, whoever is listed on your statement of information for your nonprofit is an authorized signature for your account. So you might want, or your organization. So you might wanna check that out ahead of time and make sure you have the right person on there and then determine of those people who's going to be filling out this application. This application will um, cause a soft credit check. It's not anything that's gonna affect anyone's credit report. It's not anything um, that will give them a ping, but it will require that because the funding does come from federal and state levels and it does require checking in with the Office of Foreign uh, Control to make sure there isn't any fraudulent activity. Uh, so I wanted to let you know that ahead of time. When you fill this out, you're gonna be putting in the owner's email, the owner's information or the authorized signature, their address, their date of birth, their social security number. And then if it's a, um, a business, you would put in the percentage of ownership. If it's a nonprofit, obviously you would put in zero. And under referral partner, in this case, you would put in Californians for the Arts. And you wanna go ahead and accept that little square on the bottom where it says accept SMM text policy so that you can get updates on what's happening with your application and anything they might need. We're going to go on now to the next part, section two, which is business information. And on the business information, they're going to be asking you for your business legal name. And then if you have a DBA, you would put that in there on the right hand side. If you do not have a DBA, you must type in an A. Um, and then you'll go in and you'll put in the EIN number. Uh, if you don't have an EIN number, number you might be using uh, a social security number if it's sole proprietorship. And if you're a nonprofit, you can get that number right off your 990 or a for-profit on your tax returns. You go in and put your business address. They don't accept PO box uh, addresses. So if necessary, you might need to put in uh, another address where you can receive email or mail or post for that organization. You then put in your business phone number. And then of course, you're gonna select on the drop-down me menu, whether you're for-profit or nonprofit. This is very important because if you select the wrong category based on uh, your entity, that could render your application um, invalid. So make sure you select nonprofit if you're a nonprofit or for-profit if you're a for-profit. 
we get into the business type and you'll put down, it'll have your drop down menu, menu whether or not you're a C Corp or a 501c3 or whatever that is, state of formation. And then business date established. Again, it must be prior to June 1 of 2019. Finally, you put in your business or your website URL. If you do not have one, again, you put in N slash A because you must put in something. Okay, we then get into part two of business information on the next page, which tells you about uh, what the purposes of this grant are. Now, we, we've listed already, what are the, some of the approved expenditures? So it could be payroll, it could be rent. Edward, if you wanna to switch to the next slide, that'd be great. Um, if, um, if you select payroll as an example, and then subsequently as you're funded, you determine that um, you know, you're gonna use some of it for payroll, but you're gonna also use some of it for rent. That is not a problem. As long as you are using the funds for an approved expenditure, there is no, no problem at all with that. I just wanted to let you know. And then under the amount requested, you're gonna figure out there what you're eligible for based on either the, the maximum of 250 or 20% of your 2019 uh, gross revenue. And then under 2000 and under your, your annual gross revenue receipts 219, you'll get that right off your tax return for 2019. And um, you can answer for yourself whether or not this will create new jobs. Now under the questions of the number of full-time employees in 2020 and the number of part-time employees in 2020, they're asking you as of March 1st of 2020, how many full-time and how many part-time employees and then under number of jobs created and number of jobs retained, they are asking you as of December, 2020 there, they're wanting to see how you're impacted by uh, COVID. So that's what they want there. I'm gonna go on now to uh, number four, which is demographics. And you're gonna choose whether you're a business to business or a business to consumer. Um, I have not yet been able to access this area most likely, what does your business do? What type of business is it? And tell us more are gonna be related to what you choose here, whether it's business to business to business to consumer. Um, so if there's any issue between um, under these three, tell us more, what does your business do? You can always try toggling between the two and making sure that the right thing uh, sets up for you to pick the closest example. Then under NASIS code, as I said, um, though one of those five NASIS codes that we showed you previously are what are, uh, what are eligible. So you're going to wanna to choose one of those as it applies to your business or your organization. The rest of the demographics you would answer according to the ownership or what we've advised nonprofits to do is according to the majority of the board and staff. Then we go into section number five, which is our disclosure, disclosures. And on the disclosures, um, you're just gonna go through here and answer each one of these according to the best answers for your organization. Um, it can be a little detailed. You might, you, I know that's very difficult to read on this screen. I'm gonna tell you a few of them just so you have a heads up as to what they say. Um, they're going to want to determine your eligibility by telling us more about, you know, the things they've already said as requirements, like, do you have one or more with a booker or a promoter or those kind of things? Do you have, so really just going through based on the criteria of eligibility and making sure that you um, have those answered and that they are in, you are in fact eligible for those applications. We go on now to um, the review. So this application does give you the opportunity to just take a quick review to see if you need to edit anything, to make sure you've read the terms and conditions. You can save it and come back later if you need to go check something. And once you've got it completed, you just need to make sure that you hit the everything is good, continue, and the submit button. Once that's done, when you look at your status, it should say awaiting selection process. If it says um, incomplete, that means we haven't filled something out. You need to make sure to get that done so your application is fully in. Okay, we're gonna move on to the next page and we're gonna go on some tech tips really quick. This does has historically been a little bit of a um, area for us. 
So I'm going to introduce Harshangi from uh, Lendistry, and she's going to cover a few tech tips for us to make sure that we don't have anything in our way for getting our applications in. Thank you so much. So the first thing that's really important about this application is that you know want to use Google Chrome. Um, Google Chrome is really designed to be used with the software. It's going to allow you to have the most smooth process as far as uploading documents, filling out your application, all of that good stuff. So there's a link here to actually download Google Chrome if you don't have it already. It's free to download. And there's three important things that you need to consider. So first, you want to clear your cache. And number two, you want to use incognito mode. And number three, you want to disable pop-up blockers. So what is, what is cache data? That's basically information that is stored from previously used applications or websites that you may have filled out information before. And now this is old information that's auto-populated into this new application. So we don't want that. We want your most current information that's accurate. And so we want you to clear that data. Number two is incognito mode. So this is going to basically allow you to use a private browsing um, uh, browser so that that data that you're going to be entering in is fresh and it's going to prevent it from being remembered. And number three, that pop-up blocker. So you're going to be seeing some messages that come up throughout this application that are going to be asking you to verify the accuracy of the data that you are putting in. So it might say, you know, is this, um, you know, can you select yes or no? And so you really want to ensure that that pop-up blocker is disabled. Next step. So how do you actually clear your cache? So if you go to the right side, there are three dots on the right side of the Google Chrome. You're gonna go ahead and select that. And that is gonna go, um, you're gonna select that. And once you do, you're gonna see settings. When you see settings, go to privacy and security and then select clear browsing data. So this is gonna clear out everything, make sure that whatever you're gonna put in now is gonna be clear, you're starting um, fresh. And so you notice here there's clear browsing history, notice um, the download history. So select all of these and then select clear data. Next slide. So in terms of the incognito mode, it's gonna be the same thing. When you go to the right side, those three dots, it says new incognito window. So this is where you will actually um, hit that and then start, start your actual application. Next window. Um, and then in terms of the disabling pop-up blocker, it's gonna be the same steps. You'll click on those three dots, go to settings, privacy and security, but this time you'll actually select site settings and select pop-ups and redirects. So you wanna just ensure that that blue button goes from blocked um, to allow. And this will actually allow those messages to come up during the actual application. Next slide. So in terms of preparing your documents, I would say this is the most one of the most important parts of uploading your documents and making sure that we as the processing team are able to actually open your documents and prevent any delays um, with your actual application reviews. So with all the documents, you wanna ensure that they're all in PDF format, it's clear and it's aligned straight. There is no background in the picture and it's not blurry. So you can see the samples right here. So on the left, this is what we want to see. And on the right is something that we don't want to see. Um, important parts to the actual application um, uploads for documents, make sure that the file size is under 15 megabytes. Make sure that the name that you actually put in is doesn't have any special characters like an explanation point or a plus sign. Um, that's gonna, not going to allow you to actually upload. So make sure if, if possible, you can put the actual name of what the file is like 2019 tax returns or ID. Um, and if your file is password protected, you will need to actually put in the password for us to actually open that document. Um, if you do not have a scanner, um, you can always download these applications. They're free to use. And if you have an Android or Apple phone, go ahead and um, download the appropriate scanning app. And that way you can just take a picture, make sure it's clear, it's straight, and you take a picture and that will convert it to a PDF. Next slide. Um, using a valid email address. So in the actual system, it does not register email addresses that are starting with info at or ending with at contact.com or at no reply.com. So the system will not actually send any messages to these email addresses. So please make sure that what, whatever email address that you're using as your login, it's unique 
and it's specific and it's something that you do have access to because this is how the processing team is going to be sending you updates and information about your actual application. Um, and in the event that you fill out the application and then later you realize that you put in the wrong email address, that is okay, do not worry. We have the call center for you to actually reach out and they will be able to help you with that part. Do not actually submit another application because this is going to create a duplicate in our system and we do not want duplicates. We do not want this application to be marked as a red flag for fraud because more applications and with the same information will be marked as a red flag. So please do not do another application. Um, for this specific program, yes, please apply for this specific program. You can use the same email address, but please make sure you're not doing more than one application. Next slide. I can take it from here, Hoshangi. Thank, Thank you. you. Yeah. So now we're going to talk about uploading documents. Again, I just want to reinforce that you do not need to have all your documents to upload to apply. Um, if you do have your documents, you are highly encouraged to do so as soon as possible. So once you get in there, you're going to have all your documents in the formats that Harshangi already talked about. You're going to make sure they're straight, they're legible, they're clear. You're going to see a little um, area where it's asking for each thing, the, the government tax ID, the tax, or excuse me, government issued ID, the tax returns, the finan interim financials, the letter of exemption if you're a nonprofit or any corporate um, documents from the Secretary of State. You would load each one separately and as appropriate, you can password and encode them and then they'll be available. We'll go on to the next page, which lists for you specifically the documents required. Um, the application certification, you'll be able to print out from the page once it's available, uh, print, initial, sign, and then scan and have it available like all the other documents. Under your business uh, documents for your tax returns, you can use a 1120, a, one, 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 a 1040, a 1065. For California, you can use the 100, the 565 to 540. And for nonprofits, of course, you have your 990 for your federal and your 199 for your California. Everything else is pretty straightforward and normal. You should be easy to get access to your interim financials covering quarters two, three, and four. Um, and then you, again, if you're a nonprofit, your tech, your statement of nonprofit status from the, from the uh, IRS. Uh, and then of course, finally, you're gonna have that California Secretary of State filing that you're legally doing business in the state of California. Go on to the next page. And I'm just showing you where you're going to be able to print out your application certification. Again, this is another area where if you are a for-profit, you wanna make sure to print out that one. And you will know because on the very top of it, it will say for-profit, or if you're a nonprofit, it will say nonprofit. You just need to make sure that you printed, initialed, signed, we can go to the next page, uh, the right one. And so that's that. The final step will then be, we'll go to the next page. Um, would be linking your financials with uh, Plaid. And it's gonna walk you through when you go onto the application, how to do that. Next page, please. And it's gonna locate your banking institution. You're gonna sign in. It's going to ask you for some confidential information about your bank. That's how they link it. This is uh, essential because this is how you get paid. Uh, should, should you be awarded the grant, you'll receive uh, an electronics funds transfer and then confirm commission. Uh, some, I've had a lot of questions about this. Some people are concerned. So far, it's worked great. We haven't had any problems. I encourage you to do that. And then finally, I want to go over to the application statuses on the next page. So again, if you've completed everything properly on your application, whether or not you've uploaded your documents, it will say awaiting selection process. If it says incomplete, there's something that you need to go back in and fix in your application. Once it's pulled for review and then it'll be pending validation that's when they need all your documents to look at so if you are still not in possession of your uh, 2020 tax return because of your fiscal year i would suggest you try to get that done as soon as possible doesn't mean you shouldn't apply please apply anyway but you want to get that done as soon as possible so that you can upload that document if for whatever reason you're deemed um ineligible and you're, and you're not qualified, it will say not, not selected. And if 
your application is pulled for validation and you don't have your documents, it may become inactive. Once you have your documents, you want to contact myself, contact Blendistry, get that made active again and get those documents uploaded so we can get you through the process for potential validation. We're going to go to the final, the last page. That's all we have. This is the contact information for myself. You've got my email right there. Uh, Sue's available as well. And then there's the link to go on to the venues grant itself. We have quite a few questions in our Q&A, so I'd like to go through that now. Um, Harshangi, do you want to start? I see you've got a couple there you want to answer live. Harshangi, did you want to answer some questions live? Otherwise, we can start to take them as well. Um, if you want to go ahead and take them, I was just replying to some of them um, at the moment. Okay, great. Um, Tara, we have, a, um, we have some questions that a number of people have asked. Great. And one of those is, what is the time frame that people have to spend down any awards that they receive? Mm -hmm. um, well, my knowledge is that since it's retroactive, it can be used for any expenses as of March 20 uh, current. Um, it's not um, sued, Sue or Harshangi. Does it go further than a, the award time? Does it go into 2022? I don't believe so, but. I don't think we have guidance on that. Yeah, so I, I would focus on, um, most of us had an, a large number of expenses from March of 20 until uh, the end, you know, October of 2021 that we can cover. So that's what I would be focused on. Uh, any expense that's approved that has not yet been covered by anything else. Uh, another question that I saw a couple of times that I wanted to bring up was people wanted me to clarify what percentage had to be from ticket sales and it was 70%. I saw that a couple of times. Uh, what else and do we have to one of, uh, one of the questions that's come up a couple of times is what if you rent a venue as opposed to own a venue? Are you still eligible? I, my, I mean, my assumption on that would be you'd have to check the live events eligibility requirements because one of the codes, um, the NIAX codes, is even without facilities, right? So I would say if you fit the live events eligibility requirements, which I don't know if Eddie wants to quickly scroll back to that page, uh, then that would um, I would we would encourage you to apply again because. Um, we don't know uh, every answer until you get your application in. Great. We also have several folks that were asking us to comment on the differences between the California Venues Program and the Shuttered Venues Program at the federal level. I don't think we have an analysis available on that, do we, Tara? I don't. I don't know if anyone online um, can address that one. Yeah, I mean, uh, there are a number of things that are are different in the program. Um, of course, the biggest one being it's 16 billion versus 150 million. So that's probably where you're going to see a little bit more uh, in terms of restrictions of um, who could be um, applicable for this in the state of California. I think we had over um, one billion point six million dollars in SVOG grants for this state. So. Um, obviously we couldn't match that at the state level. So um, it is not something where every person who got SVOG will be eligible for this grant. Um, the folks at NEVA California who are also doing webinars um, have a lot more expertise specifically on um, the Shutter Venues Operators Grant or SVOG. Um, but uh, I think, you know, for example, uh, there were a number of movie theaters that were able to get SVOG grants. And uh, according to the eligibility that is, and the NIAX codes, that is not um, who this grant would be for. So that's one example. But just again, I think what's most important is to make sure you look at those eligibility requirements, see if you can match those. And if you can, then you should definitely apply. Great. We have an, another question uh, from a nonprofit organization that holds events um, 
at a venue where they pay the artists as independent contractors, but the other staff that work their events are paid by the venue or another company. Would they be eligible to apply? I think they're referring to that, um, uh, that qualification that states what type of employees you need to have. I think Harshangi answered that and said it was okay. Is that correct, Harshangi? Sorry, what was the question? Can they be independent contractors um, versus employees in terms of the people you hire? I mean, if you're performing art center, you're not uh, making Willie Nelson your uh, employee when you bring him into town. So right. obviously a lot of your expenses, um, et cetera, you know, uh, are, are independent contractors in some regard. Right. Okay, um, we have a lot of folks who are asking for, could we um, review that 70% of revenue requirements? That seems to be one that uh, folks are, uh, several folks have questions about. Yeah, that's probably because I messed it up. Um, so my understanding is that you must demonstrate a decl declination of 70% in your revenue from 219 to 220 for eligibility. And um, when we talk about that revenue, is that the earned revenue or the gross revenue? My understanding is that it's gross revenue. Okay. It's gross earned revenue. It's gross earned revenue. So if you're a nonprofit, According to what we understand, based on the way the legislation is written, it does not include contributions. Mm. So in other words, if you are a nonprofit performing arts center or ballet company or whatever else it is, the 70% you're gonna analyze both on the one side of the equation and on the other side of the equation are both based only on your earned. So, uh, you know, it means that you have to have a significant amount in ticket sales. That's the, the concept of this, primarily. Does Julie, would, would earned revenue only be counted as ticket sales or would say something like interest earned on accounts, which is typically counted as earned revenue for nonprofits also count? Can we go to the eligible requirements on the screen that talk about the specifics of the 70%? Um, here, I think it is here. Oh, yeah, go, nope, you had it. One more, one, no, <laughs> uh, just no. Uh, go back, I, I go forward, I guess. Sorry, everybody, this is live and it, this is live. Go forward one more. Tara, do you know where the slide is that I'm looking for? Uh, I'm trying to look to the, find the one that says 70% um, on eligible, uh, in eligible requirements for, you know, you're gonna go backwards, Eddie. You're going to need to go back. Okay, stop. <laughs> stop, oh, you had it. <laughs> uh, I think either forward or backward one. Sorry, everybody. Okay, stop. Eligible independent live event. At least 70% of the earned revenue individual or entity is generated through cover charges or ticket sales, production fees or production reimbursements, or the sale of event beverages, food, or merchandise. So see, the answer would be no to that question, would not include your earned revenue. So this is where, this is, it's very specific on what we're um, defining as earned revenue. Does that make sense? Thank you. I, one of the things that I've seen consistently is the question about NIAX codes, and we just want to address that because this is something we've addressed a lot with both the state and industry. We understand, particularly for nonprofits, uh, this is new terminology that we're not as uh, familiar with, except for as we've been applying for grants in this last year and a half. And um, so sometimes this is an arbitrary list that maybe your accountant chooses. And now all of a sudden your NIAX code isn't going to list the five here, seven, one, you know, going, starting with the ones that are eligible in terms of the grant, 71310 or 711320, for example. And so what we want to just say is that still apply. If all of your other eligibility makes sense in terms of this right side of the column and everything that's read, you should still apply, even if your NIAX code says uh, you're a dinner theater or in theater or a musical artist or group. 
still apply because we are definitely making sure that this uh, you know, um, program meets the needs of what the intention of the legislature legislation was, which is exactly what the side on the right says. The NIAX codes are a little bit more limiting. So just want to, again, encourage people to apply. We cannot help you through the process. And Tara and Sue experienced this a lot with the Cultural Institutions Grant um, through the California Relief Grant Program that we were able to work with Lendistry, who also their intention is to get the money out uh, if it's el if you're eligible, so please do apply. Parshanti, did you want to add anything to that? No. Or Patrice? You're good. I'm on a call, so hopefully I won't bother you. <laughs> oh, no, you're good. Just please mute. I, <laughs> I was just going to reiterate that I totally agree with that, and so really that's the most important thing that you can do at this time is apply because we will review your application fully and if there are anything that you know we can resolve we will um, but at this point just please apply by um, the actual deadline and so the the windows should be yes, opening up on so the 29th um, the window should be opening up on the 29th and so um, submit your application any questions that you have please send us send us um, those questions but um, that's the biggest thing that I can say. Um, and once again, um, just focus on the few things that would make you eligible for this program, right? So, you know, do you have that um, loss in revenue from 2019 to 2020? That is one thing. Do you, um, are you earning revenue from your ticket sales or production fees as, as 70% is, if those, um, Revi is it earn revenue from those um, areas? So please just focus on the few things that do make you eligible, and then anything else that's um, you know kind of pending, we will address that throughout. Thank you, Harshangi. Um, I have a I see a question here that I'm not sure I have the answer to, and I wonder if you might. It says twenty percent of our fiscal year or twenty percent of our calendar year. And they're wondering about that when when if they're because they must probably are a nonprofit with a different. Uh, fiscal year based on what they're eligible for. Do you know the answer to that, Harshangi? I do Is not. It? Okay. Yeah. So we'll try to we'll try to clarify that. I'm imagining it's going to be your fiscal year because it's going to be off your taxes. That'd be my guess. Um, but we'll try to get some clarification for that answer. Hey Tara, here's an easy one for you. Uh, we're a 501c3 organization. Why would we need to submit an individual's driver's license or passport when we are in an organization? Uh, because again, the person that's gonna sign for this has to be registered on your statement of information with the Secretary of State, and they must go in a, a very soft credit check, a background check to make sure there's no fraudulent activity because this is federal and state money. And I see a lot of questions about the um, earned revenue portion, which we understand. Um, trust me, I've run a nonprofit performing arts center. I've also currently run a nonprofit, Californians for the Arts. We do understand the difference. And that is why it does say call out in the legislation over and over again, gross earned revenue, because we do understand the difference between gross revenue and gross earned revenue. However, there's still some details to be worked out on that. So continue to ask those questions. You know your business and the specificity of your business better than of course anybody else. So continue to ask those questions in the Q&A here. We will do our best to get all the answers um, that we can at this time. And then as you're um, working through the process to apply when it opens, hopefully this Friday, um, Tara uh, for Californians for the Arts will be available um, at the email that we've listed a couple of times in the chat to help you. Um, and so, and then Sue from Cal Nonprofits, and then you'll have others from uh, Neva, California as well. And then of course, Lendistry also has their call center. So, you know, really the idea here is that we want to make this as um, accessible for you to apply and to get that money. That's our goal. Yeah. I see some more questions. It's a repeat of the one that you already answered, Julie, about if you're a nonprofit, but you don't have a permanent space, but you rent space. Again, there is a, there is a code for that. Um, so that does not automatically exclude you. You just want to make sure you, you meet the other criteria, as Julie had mentioned earlier. Um, let's see. I'm just trying to see if there are any other questions that we haven't answered yet. Do you see any, Sue? Uh, let's see here. Well, while you're looking, I'm just going to, Kristen, uh, in the chat uh, or in the question said 70% of loss of income, is that gross or can it be 70% loss of just earned income, i.e. ticket sales, 
we lost 100% of ticket sales, but not 70% of all income due to donations. And Kristen, our understanding is that's why it's gross earned revenue exactly for that reason. Because uh, you know we understand that nonprofits were able to get um, donations during this time period, but had uh, zero in ticket sales. But that's why it's correct on both sides of the equation. You can also only get a grant based on the loss of your earned gross earned revenue because it wouldn't be fair if it was based on um, your uh, or what you know on what is your revenue on that side. It has to be based on your only earned revenue. Does that make sense on both sides of the equation? Do you know what I'm saying, Tara? Can you, you know what I want to clear that up for me? So I say yeah, it no, correctly. I, I, well, it's complicated, but but I do understand what you're saying that you want to actually analyze what is earned versus what is, uh, this is specific to nonprofits, what is earned versus what is contributed. And you wanna use that as your margin for loss. Um, so that, that, that actually makes it more, um, it's more uh, open for a nonprofit. So it's great. Um, right, and if, and anybody, if, if yeah. anybody has any questions, you can email me. I can kind of walk you through it. I know it's a little bit complicated. Right. Or if you take that language to your financial person, they'll probably be able to show you how to do it as well. And, right. And somebody anonymous said most performing arts nonprofits do not derive more than 70% of total revenue from ticket sales. That's correct. But we're talking about total gross earned revenue, right? Versus gross revenue. Right. So your gross earned revenue is what you're analyzing. Yeah. And this and this grant is not necessarily for all nonprofits. It's for nonprofits that do venues and performances, you know, specific to that. So um, somebody asked if we're allowed to have digital signatures. You are. Um, that's actually how you'll sign your closing documents if you receive an award and the um, the uh, form that you have to complete to say that you're you're accepting this grant. Um, is also a digital, it is available digitally if you wanna do that. So that'll be available for you. We also have a question as to what is the URL for the application? Um, that should be, we should post that in the um, chat already. It's the same URL for the website. That's where the application will go live at uh, hopefully 9 a.m. on Friday. Um, so I'll look for that really quick. We have a question about if this is this presentation is going to be available. Yes, we will load both the recording of this presentation and the PDF slides of this presentation. So you have that available on our website. Um, it should be there by Friday as well. Okay, I don't see. Uh, yes, renting is okay because you can use this to pay rent. Yes, that is true. Uh, okay, I, I don't see, is there anything else, Sue or Julie or Hoshangi that's sticking out that is a new question we haven't answered yet? I don't think so. Okay, we will download all of your questions and we will be using this together with Lendistry to create a uh, frequently asked question list and have that available for everyone. This is the first webinar that we've done on the topic. So I'm sure there's a lot of questions here. Um, and we will also be having sub subsequent um, webinars. Our next one is actually going to be on the 2nd at 4 p.m. So if you know anybody else that would like to join, please let them know. And we'll have that, that information on how to register available on our website. And I can just answer a couple since we've got about five more minutes, little questions. If your organization received an SVA grant, are you still eligible for the California Venues Grant Program? The answer is yes. Yes. Um, so please do apply. Um, and some of these have already been answered, but if you received a grant through Lendistry, do we need to use a new email address for the California Venues Grant Pro Program application? The answer is no, because this is a new application. Um, is LA County considered a California relief grant or just if from directly the state of California? I'm not sure I understand that. Uh, I think I do, Julie. Okay. LA County also had a COVID relief program, and that okay. is a county program as opposed to the um, state program. So the answer is no, that is not a California relief grant. Thank you. And we also had a question uh, about, uh, about gr uh, other grant amounts being deducted from this award. So it might be useful to uh, review 
that um, the only grant award that would be deducted from this amount would be if you received a California relief grant. Private uh, foundation, like private grants like foundations or something like from their county or city are not deducted from your grant award. Only the California relief grant if you received it because those are both state programs. Something I'd like to just add is that, is this a first come first serve grant? And it is not, so please apply. All of the applications are going to be reviewed. So please apply as long as you get your application in. So once again, it is not a first come first serve grant. I see okay. several questions around the NASIS codes again. And um, you just have to pick one of those five if it's applicable to you. And that's the NASIS code you want to choose um, for the application. It's okay if it's not the one you used before, as long as it applies to your organization. I think again, just the, if there's one takeaway that we can give to you here today, it is please apply. The um, application is not like many nonprofits do long narratives. Um, you don't have to write sort of like, what's your program going to look like, you know, when you many of us have made those kind of applications. So it's really mostly based on um, documentation and do you fit the eligibility requirements. And so it shouldn't be onerous. It shouldn't take, uh, you know, what some grants take, which is can be weeks for uh, staff members to be writing. That is not the intention of these types of grants. So please do take a look at it once soon as it launches. Uh, do contact us if you get stuck or have questions. That's what we're here for. Um, and as we uh, capture all of these remaining specific, specific questions around earned revenue, we understand all of that. Um, please note that we will be updating FAQs both at the CaliforniaVenuesGrant.com website. Um, and we will be offering uh, as many answers as we can as quickly as we can. But again, all we can impart to you is please, if you think you're eligible based on the eligibility requirements apply and apply before November 19th. That's the main, main thing we really want to um, put out there. So appreciate everybody's time. Anything else you want to add, Tara? I'm just going to answer one more question. They wanted me to explain what I said up front about the grant amount being deducted from another award. Simply means that if you did apply to the California COVID relief grant through the state of California Lendistry and you received it, whatever amount you receive there would be deducted from your award here. That's all that means. Um, I think that's it. We're coming up on time. Uh, we really appreciate everyone's attendance and your patience as we work through all these details. It is a lot of information and we understand that. I will be available to answer your questions um, and I will get back to you as soon as I have those, those answers to everything you've put in. Thank you for being part of the process and for your interest in the California Venues Grant Program.